Father, we bless you. We magnify you. Amen, amen. Blessings and glory. Father, we ascribe unto you. Father, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. You are the almighty God. There is none that can be likened unto you. You speak and it is so. You command and it is so. Who is it that speaks and it comes to pass? When you have not commanded it, you are not man that you should lie, not the son of man that you should repent. Have you said it? Have you not done it? Have you said it? Will you not make it good? You are God all by yourself, the self-existing God, the King of glory, our God, the lover of our souls, our Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. We worship you. We bow down before you, Lord God Almighty. We give you glory, honor, majesty. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you because it is you that sustains us. We thank you because it is you, in you that we all live and walk and have our being. We lift up our eyes unto you because you are our source of help. Father, our very lives, we owe it to you. We are alive because you have kept us alive. It is of your mercies that we are not consumed. Glory be to your holy name forevermore. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to learn of you. We ask, O oh Lord, that you speak to us this morning in the name of Jesus. Open our eyes, O oh Lord, so that we can behold wondrous things out, things out of your word in the name of Jesus. Lord, I commend myself on you. Father, let every word that comes out of my mind this morning originate from you in Jesus' name. Let this word mix with faith, O oh Lord, and let it profit all the errors in the name of Jesus. Take all the glory, Jehovah. Blessed be your holy name, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Before we sit, let's uh, open our Bibles to the book of 2 Peter chapter 1. God bless you. Uh, a round of applause for the grace of God on chosen vessels. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, you alone deserve the praise. First Peter, uh, second Peter, pardon me. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Praise the Lord. Let's be seated. God bless you. Uh, so last week, Sunday, we learned about uh, why Isaac is important. And we looked at some of the things that we could learn from his coming and um, his, his life. And we'll be learning a lot more about Isaac in the course of the year. And one of the things we learned was that Isaac was a, the fulfillment of God's promise. You can say, uh, like we heard on Tuesday, Isaac is God's promise on two legs. Praise the Lord. So that's one of the things we, we learned uh, last week. And uh, Isaac was the promise. So the promise of Isaac was not to Isaac. The promise of the promise that became Isaac was to somebody else, Abraham. And the word for us this year is that Isaac is coming. So, amen, hallelujah. But there is more to getting your Isaac than saying amen. Uh, so, God, in his grace, will open our eyes to some of those things that will help us to receive a promise of Isaac and see it come to manifestation. Amen. So those are the things we'll look at tonight. Uh, look at look at this morning. So Abraham, uh, the promise of Isaac was made to Abraham. The, that declaration 
is made to us that our Isaac is coming. So what, why is this promise and its fulfillment significant to us as in you and I, as we are now today here? And uh, how do we benefit from it? Um, so let's, let's, we'll study a bit of the interaction between God and Abraham as it pertains to the promise of Isaac. And we see how we, how we draw a parallel with our own lives and the interactions that God has with us and how we are able to receive our own promises and see them manifest in Jesus' name. If you go to the book of Genesis chapter 12, when God called Abraham, you will see that the first thing God made to Abraham was not the promise of a son, even though uh, if you go to towards the end of chapter 11, verse 30, the Bible says that Sarai was barren and had no, she had no child. But when God called Abraham, when God approached him, when God made him made contact with him, the first thing he did was not to promise him a son, was to offer him a, a relationship. So if you read Genesis 12, 1 to 3, it's a scripture I believe we are familiar with. Let's read Acts 7, 2 and 3. When uh, Steve, uh, Stephen's account of that, of that scripture. He says, and he said, brethren and father, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Ar. And he said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Praise the Lord. So God called him out first. God wanted it. it, it God wanted the basis of a relationship with him. He goes ahead to now make promises, having given him that instruction. So that's the first thing we see. God's contact with Abraham was not first to solve an obvious an obvious problem he had, which is, was that Sarai didn't have a child. And in fact, in the course of their relationship, that problem wasn't solved for a while. Even though Abraham was a friend of God, he was faithful to God. God called him righteous. So we get back. So that's the first thing we note. The second thing was that that offer of friendship, that offer of relationship, was uh, an instruction, a call to do something. So if you go back to Genesis 12, say God has said to Abraham, get out of your country, your family, your father's house, your land, I'm going to show you. Uh, then God now tells him what he's going to do. So that offer was that call was an instruction to do something. Joshua 24, 2. Also, uh, do, uh, Genesis 12, 12, 1 tells us, tells him to leave. Tell, uh, tells us that God told Abraham to leave. Joshua 24, verse 2, clarifies it a little bit as to what was going on in Ur of the Chaldeans, where he left. Again, this is uh, Joshua's account when he was talking to Abraham's descendants, the children of Israel. Joshua, technically you can help me. Okay, I found it. Joshua chapter 24, verse 2. It says, and Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. So that's what God called him away from. That's what God told him to leave. Again, uh, there are no specifics around the sun in the picture yet. And that goes ahead to make him promises. We see that in 2 and 3 of Genesis 12. It says, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So that, the first thing God gave Isaac was not a promise. It was offered him a basis of a relationship. That offer was an instruction, a call away from idolatry. And that offer also included promises. Uh, if you read verse 4 of Genesis 12, it says, So Abraham departed 
as the Lord had spoken to him. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. How did we know that Abraham accepted that offer that God made him? We see it in that beginning of Gen uh, Genesis 12, 4. He departed. Um, did he depart because of the prevailing economic situation in all of the Chaldeans? No. Did he depart because uh, of family issues? No. He departed as the Lord had spoken to him. So, Abraham accepted the offer by doing what God says, therefore obligating God to now fulfill that promise. God says, leave and I'll do this. So, he left then. He triggered the fulfillment of those promises. Uh, point number five. And we also see, if you continue uh, from Genesis 12, 13, 14, 15, it details God's relationship and on. It details God's relationships with, uh, and interactions with Abraham. And we see that in continuing with God, because his obedience was not a one-time thing, he left and God gave him further instructions which he obeyed and more promises as he continued with God. So we see that Abraham's obedience and continuing relationship led to more promises. So, for instance, in verse 7 of Genesis 12, God promised him and his descendants the land, even though he was still dwelling in tents on them. Praise the Lord. But God promised my descendants the land. And we see that in Genesis 14 and Genesis uh, verse 14 and 15 of Genesis 12 as well. God made him very wealthy. I mean, Genesis 13, 6 tells us that because the his resources and that of Lot was great, they couldn't, the land couldn't contain both of them. And when um in chapter 24, let's read that. When he, uh, Eliezer was going to look for a bride for Isaac in verse 35, it says, uh, so let me read from verse 34. So it says, he it said, I'm Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master greatly and he has become great. Remember what God promised him in Genesis 12. And he has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold, male and female servants and donkeys. Praise the Lord. So we see that as he continued in that relationship, he got a whole lot more from God. And of God, of God, God promised him multiplication as well. We see that in verse 16 of Genesis 13. And of course, God promised him his son. God told him verse in chapter 12 that was going to make him great and all of that. But we see God specifically promising him a son and then subsequently clarifying that that son is going to breathe from Sarah and they're going to call him Isaac because God said he was going to give him a son and then they had Ishmael. We know the story. And Abraham in chapter 17 said, let Ishmael live before you. I mean, and God said, no. In fact, let's read it. God said, no, you are going to have a child from, from Sarah. So, and all of this came as he continued, as he continued with God. Um, 17, uh, 19, Genesis 17, 19. God said, no, Sarah, your wife will bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and his descendants after him. So we see that as he continued with God, he got more promises. He got spe more specific promises and, and ultimately got Isaac. And one of the things he also got was a covenant. Praise the Lord. More than the promise. He started out with an instruction, then promises, and God cut a covenant with him. We see all that in Genesis chapter 15. So that's what Abraham got as a result of a obeying God, and continuing with God. Uh, another point we note about Abraham and his interaction with God is that because Abraham trusted God, even though he didn't have anything tangible to show for God's promise yet, the Bible says God account counted it to him for righteousness. So in Gen we see that in Genesis chapter 15. When 
Abraham was telling God, look, you have not given me a child. Is it this Eliezer of Damascus that will inherit me? God said no. God brought him outside, told him to count the stars. God gave him a vision of the future he had for him. And verse 6 of Genesis 15 says, and he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So Abraham was made righteous because he believed in what God had said, even though there was nothing tangible to show for it yet. Now, what does all of this have to do with us? What well, God is calling you and I to. You see who is reaching out to call Abraham. You have challenges, you have issues you are dealing with. God sees them, he knows. But you know when he called Abraham, the first thing he did was not to solve his problem, was to offer him a relationship. And God is calling you and I too. The book of Hebrews 1, 2 says that God, I, and in the end time, has spoken to us through Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So let's read uh, Matthew 22, 14. And see what he says. God is, God is calling you and I. God is calling you and I. God is calling you and I. For many are called. For many are called, but few are chosen. For many are called. Acts 2.38, speaking about God calling us. After uh, Peter had preached on the day of Pentecost, and the people asked him, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So the same way God is calling Abraham, he's calling you and I. The same way God's call to Abraham, that offer of a relationship as an instruction to depart from somewhere, to leave something. Such is the call we have from God to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, it says, Therefore, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. God wants a relationship, a father-son, father-daughter relationship. He knows you have challenges. He knows you have issues. He knows you have needs. He knows there are things you want him to do for you. But his own priority is to bring you into that relationship with you. And to do that, he calls you. And then he has this instruction for you. He says, so what does he require us to do in, uh, uh, for him to be a, a father to us, for us to be sons and daughters to him, as stated in verse 18, we should come out from among them and be separate. The same way he called Abraham to come out from idol worship. God calls us to repentance. Let's look at Isaiah 55, verse 7. So that call includes an instruction to repent, to come out. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God calls us to repentance. Book of Matthew chapter 3 says, repent, three to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The same way God's initial contact with Abraham was to offer him a relationship. 
that offer including is a call, an instruction, a demand, a requirement to leave sin and worldliness behind. Same he does to us too. God's offer to us also includes great promises. In fact, uh, the book of Second Peter we read as our text says, exceeding great and precious promises. Now, the Bible could have said, the Bible doesn't waste words, praise the Lord. Uh, there's an interesting scripture in the book of Galatians, which we, will, which we will go to in a bit more. Let me just read it now to make a point around um, why we should be particular about words in scripture. Uh, this is talking about the promise to Abraham and how it affects us. We are going to get to it subsequently. It says, uh, Galatians 3.15, it says, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet it's confirmed. So in other words, he's giving an example from human affairs that we are used to. It says, verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises, were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. So the Bible is saying there that the scripture does not say seed. It said seed. So that S after seed makes a whole lot of difference. Therefore, when the Bible is telling us, is the book in the book of 2 Peter, that we have exceeding great and precious promises. Exceedingly great and precious promises. It could have said we have promises. It will still be correct. It could have said we have precious promises and that will be fine. It could have said we have great promises and that I said exceedingly great and precious promises. So back to the Galatians, book of Galatians we just read, uh, chapter 3. God also has promises for us. It says Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, because it's everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. How many of us here are Jews? You, are, you have Jewish blood. You have Jewish ancestry. Okay, no, no, I, okay, yeah, I will guess so. So, as far as Jews are concerned, we are Gentiles. I mean, Gentile doesn't mean you are a bad person. It just means that you are not Jewish. So, they are Jews and Gentiles. So, the Bible says that because of Jesus Christ, the blessing of Abraham might come upon you and I. We are here today. We can claim all those promises that God made to Abraham and his descendants because of what Jesus Christ did. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So, God promised to us God's, God's instruction to us uh, includes great promises as well. Uh, and one of those promises we read in, in, in 1 Peter 1 for is that uh, so that we can partake of the divine nature. Partake of the divine nature. What is the divine nature? God's nature. God's nature. Can God be sick? No. Can God lack? No. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Was Jesus Christ sick when he was here on that? No. The Bible says, he will not, I will not allow any of these of Egyptians to come upon you because I am the God that heals you. Everything that Jesus needed on earth, he did. There was nothing that Jesus wanted to do and they couldn't do because they didn't have money. There was nowhere that Jesus Christ wanted to go that he couldn't go because he didn't have money. So, God is holy. So, we are not struggling to be holy. We are not struggling to please God. Those are some aspects of the divine nature. Those are some of the things that some of the things that we are promised. Praise the Lord. So, God's God, those, those promises are not just uh, optional for us if we want or not, provided we do what God requires of us. We're actually entitled to them. If you uh, continue down from that Galatians chapter 3, um, from verse 26, 
Galatians 3, 26 to 29, says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many as of you were baptized into Jesus Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. Now, 29, this is the clincher. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So it's not only that we have access to the promise or we can enjoy it. We're actually entitled to them. We, we can get them as a matter of right. Praise the Lord. That is what God has for us, as he had for Abraham, that led to the promise of Isaac and his fulfillment. So what does all of this hinge on? Our obedience. It was Abraham's obedience. In Genesis 2, verse 4, the Bible departed as the Lord has said, that obligated God to fulfill his promise, that set the ball of promise fulfillment ruling. Praise the Lord. So if you go back to that uh, text, First Peter, uh, Second Peter rather. So you see a few things there about the call and about what we do about the call. So verse 2 starts by saying grace and peace multiply to you in the knowledge of God, uh, of God and Savior Jesus Christ. If you go down to verse 4, uh, no, sorry, verse 3, it says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Now, who is he referring to? Uh, if you go back to the Verse 1, just after the introduction, it says to those who have obtained or received like precious faith. So those who have, in response to that call by glory and virtue, received like precious faith are the ones all of the things that he's saying here applies to. So it is our obedience that triggers the fulfillment of God's promise. Let's quickly see an example in Luke chapter 5. Uh, when Jesus borrowed Peter's boat and told him to lay down his net for a catch. And let's read the beginning of verse 6. Uh, what does it say? First uh, Peter 5, 6. Let's read it out loud. Let's read that loud. I, hope you, I believe you're opening your Bibles. What does it say? Uh, sorry, Luke chapter 5, verse 6. And when, and when he had done this, they caught a great number of fish. And when, So when did they get a great number of fish? When Jesus Christ spoke? No. When he did what Jesus Christ said, that is when he got the overflowing blessing. I will say another example when Jesus Christ in Luke 17, 14, about the cleansing the ten lepers. He said, go and show yourself to the priest. And the Bible says that as they went, they were cleansed. So they were cleansed as they went. Praise the Lord. So it is all these nice things that we have been saying prior. It is your obedience that triggered it. They will remain of no effect in your life, God forbid, if you choose not to obey God, if you choose not to respond to God's offer of a relationship and continue in it. God's purpose for bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt was to take them to the promised land. Did all of them get to the promised land? No. Did God fulfill his promise of getting them to the promised land? What is the difference? Some choice is down to your choice. Praise the Lord. By the way, that's the topic for next Sunday in the Yaya class. Sunday school advert. The power of choice. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, to get your Isaac, you have to obey God. There's no shortcut to it. If you want this declaration that your Isaac is coming, then you need to, you know, obedience is critical. It hinges on your obedience. God has spoken he has declared, you know what he requires of you, then he's waiting for you to obey. You obey, then it triggers the fulfillment of those promises. 
We said Abraham continued in obedience and he got more. As we also continue in our obedience and that relationship, if we accept the offer, first of all, we see that God offers us more. First Corinthians 2 9. Even the things that we haven't, we don't even know exist. It's something that you are aware of that you can ask for. Oh, I want this type of house. Oh, I want this type of car. I want this type of job. I want to make this type of money. It is within your realm of possibility. It is within your realm of imagination. That's why you can ask for it. But God promises us more than that. He say, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor hear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So the problems you have now that you are praying to God for, don't worry, as you continue with God, he will address them. But he has much more in store for you if you will just continue in him. And he says the things that, not only that you have not conceptualized it, other people have not thought about it yet. Praise the Lord. Those are the things he has for us as we continue to obey him. So, I mean, what are some of the other things he has? The Bible says that uh, um, unto you is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Let's read Ephesians 3. Read, let's read from verse 16 to that verse that I just quoted now. It says that it will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with mind. Ephesians 3, 16. To be strengthened with mind through his spirit in your inner mind that Christ may dwell in your heart. So Christ has to be living in you through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all fullness of God. He now says, now, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. According to the power that works in us. Praise the Lord. John 15, 7. Another thing that he promises to do if we continue in him. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. If you abide, stay, continue. Like Abraham, we also have our own covenant. Hebrews 13. Our own covenant. We know we are saying that the fact that Abraham continued in relationship with God, even when he faltered, he didn't, he didn't step back from God. He continued. Continued to call upon God. Continued to build altars. And God, God gave him more, more promises. He promised him the land to his descendants. He made him wealthy, multiplied him, gave him Isaac, and of course, cut a covenant with him. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Speaking of our own covenant, he said, May the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work, to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So we have a whole covenant as well. And of course, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 25 and 26 tells us about the covenant that is ours in the blood of Jesus. And finally, on this point, Hebrews 9, 14. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So that's one of the things that the blood of Jesus Christ does. For. The blood of Jesus Christ is not only for protection. It is one of the things it does for us is to cleanse us cleanse our conscience from dead works to be able to serve God. And finally, speaking on righteousness, God, God made Abraham righteous because he believed him, because he trusted him. 
And that is how we get righteous too. That is how we become righteous. Romans. Romans 4.16 says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace. So that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. In other words, not only of those who are physically descendants of Abraham, but for those of us who through the faith of Abraham has become a descendant spiritually as well, so that we can be partakers of that promise. I'll read it again. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Praise the Lord. 23 and 24, verse 23 and 24 of the same chapter says, Now, it is not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. Remember, the Bible says Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. So the Bible is saying that scripture is not written for Abraham alone. It says, but also for us, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So what is written concerning Abraham, that he believed God and he was made righteous. How do, how do we get that scripture to? How is it that it is written for us? It is written for us. It will be imputed to us who believe. So our path to being righteous, the way Abraham was righteous before God, is to believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Praise the Lord. And finally, Ephesians 2. 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, 8, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. So everybody has access to it. Your status doesn't matter. Your educational qualification doesn't matter. Where you are from doesn't matter. That you are not a physical Jew doesn't matter. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So nobody can boast about it because it's not because of anything that you have done. Abraham, the Bible says Abraham believed God. Not because he did something or he didn't do something. He believed God. And God says, yeah, God did him righteous. And we have an opportunity to be ticked righteous too. We have an opportunity to be ticked righteous too. So the question to you and I this morning is are you going to respond to that call and surrender your life to Jesus so that I can begin to enjoy these promises that we have spoken about because the call is yours. And if you are born again already, praise the Lord and God for your life. Are you going to continue in him so that you can enjoy and access all that he has in plan for you. Even those things that you don't know, that you can't, you can't figure out, you, you don't know enough to ask for it. He has it for you. We read a few scriptures in, in closing. Isaiah chapter 1. Verse 18 to 20. Isaiah 1, 18 to 20. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they, be, they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. Revelation 3, 20. Behold, 
I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Praise the Lord. God is calling you. He has great things in store for you. He wants to solve your problem. But that's not the first thing he offers you. He wants to be your God. He wants to be your father. He wants to, you to be his son. He wants you to be his daughter. That is God's primary offer. You accept that offer. You enter into a relationship with him. He will take care of you. He will sort you out. He may not solve that problem immediately. He didn't give, uh, he didn't give Abraham Isaac until 25 years after he called him. I'm not saying you will wait for 25 years. I'm just saying that God makes everything beautiful in his time. But what God offers you is a relationship, a basis for righteousness, a basis for taking you away from the kingdom of darkness and translating you to the kingdom of his dear son so that you are not under the control of the devil. You are under God's control, under his guidance, under his leadership. Let's close our eyes as we pray. We are, I will thank you for the entrance of your word. Be thou exalted in Jesus' name. Lord God Almighty, we receive grace to continue in you. Help us not to depart from you. Your word says that you will never leave us. You will not forsake us. Please help us not to leave you, not to forsake you. Father, like that hymn writer said, let your grace, like a fetter, bind our wandering hearts to you in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, that all that we have said and heard today will not stand in testimony against us. We will receive grace to profit by these words and to continue in you, Father, and to receive our Isaacs in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, we have prayed.